Welcome to episode 2 of my high-speed paddle wheel ground effect vehicle project. I posted episode 1 a couple years ago, and in that video I tested out various high-speed paddle wheel designs on various types of surface skimming vehicles. Most of those ended up working pretty well, but I was unsure if the paddle wheel designs I was trying were optimal, and I was unsure if paddle wheels in general were the right tool to use for the job. I'll talk more about what the job is later, but after that video had already aired, I went out on my boat in an attempt to find the best high-speed paddle wheel design. So this is my test setup here. I've got a wheel on a stick with a camera <laughs> and an ESC, and I'm just gonna hold it out in the water and kind of subjectively see how it feels. And then I've got a bunch of other paddle designs I'm gonna test. That makes a lot of thrust. I'm gonna get soaked doing this. So this wheel here is the design that I used on this aircraft, and it seemed to work pretty well. But next I tried out this design. It doesn't have sidewalls, and the paddles have a bit of a curve to them. The direction of the curve is a bit counterintuitive. It doesn't spin in this direction like you might think it should. I have it spinning in this direction so that the paddles don't grab as much water. This way it should do a better job at planing across the surface rather than getting sucked down deeper into the water. To test if this theory is valid, I flipped the wheel around so that the paddles are scooping into the water. It actually didn't seem to get sucked down too badly while it was traveling perfectly straight forward, but at any slight angle it would really start to get pulled down. That said, it did have a lot of forward thrust. After that, I tested a bunch of different designs, and none of them really seemed to behave that much differently. I even tested a paddle wheel and a floaty pontoon kind of thing, and it did seem to help stay on the surface, but it didn't feel all that much different than just the wheel alone. All these paddle wheels were 3D printed on the Formlabs Form 4. I've also got this surface piercing propeller on the back of another little planing hull type of thing, and that the propeller blades just kind of barely stick out below the bottom of the hull. That should be interesting. Then I've also got this propeller off of an RC speedboat. Oh, it grips, it grabs eventually. Wow, that was cool. At first I was like, damn, this thing sucks because it's just kind of like ventilating in the water or cavitating in the water. But then once the boat got going faster, then the propeller finally met its pitch speed and then suddenly I could feel it going from just like spinning water out of the way, flipping through the water to actually like the blades properly biting in and that's when it really started to produce forward thrust. Okay, next up is this proper speedboat propeller. Yeah, that makes a ton of thrust. So maybe I should build a surface piercing speedboat propeller augmented ground effect vehicle. <laughs> So that's exactly what I'm going to do, and I'm going to do it on this big Soviet era Ekranoplan that I built and flew in my previous two videos. In the last video, I got this thing working really well, so it should make for a great test platform. Step one was to hop into Onshape and modify the wingtip pontoon design so that it now has a big longtail propeller that dangles off the back. The whole longtail assembly can pivot so that it can hopefully stay in contact with the water for more of the time. If you want to access this model for yourself, it's available at the Onshape link in the description. Onshape is free for hobbyists, and it's cloud-based, so this Ekranoplan is just a click away. After that, it was time to make it. I pressed some bearings into this 3D printed longtail housing, and then screwed the motor onto the back. This thing is an aircraft, so it needs to be decently lightweight, and for that reason, I'm using titanium for the motor shafts. The stuff that I bought was slightly too large to fit on my bearings, so I plopped it into my lathe and ground down the outer diameter a little bit until it fit. That worked pretty well, and then it could slide right into the bearing and the coupler that I used to attach it to the motor shaft. This is just a 2507 FPV quad motor. The propeller just attaches to the end with some little locking collars, and there you have it. A ground effect vehicle long tail speedboat motor pod thing. Now it's time to build the rest of the wingtip float. For that, I'm using the same Bamboo Lab ASA aerofilament that I used to 3D print the rest of this airplane. The issue with 3D printing stuff that's going to go in the water is that it's hollow, so it can potentially fill up and sink. To deal with this, I used a gyroid infill so that the inside is one continuous volume, and I'm cutting holes in each individual component so that the internal volumes of every component is connected. That way I can just have one drain plug and pour any water out that might accumulate inside the float. Each float consists of two parts that get glued together, and then I painted the whole thing in polyurethane paint to hopefully keep the water out in the first place. The long tail assembly just bolts on here to the side with one long M3 bolt, and then here you can see it pivot. It's a very nice. The surface finish was a little rough after all the painting, so I quickly sanded it with some fine grit sandpaper. I had been planning to do this ever since I first started designing this Ekrano plan, so I embedded phase wires into the wing, and the wing end cap rib has threaded inserts into it, so this whole new surface drive ammo just screws right into place. 
Of course, we need two additional ESCs to go with our two additional motors, and those just attach through a series of janky Y connectors with undersized wire. So that concludes our surface drive pontoon build. Now it's time to head to the lake. Okay, let's see if this thing works at all. If you make videos like I do, or you really do anything on the computer that involves large files, then you should really know what a NAS is. If you don't, then like me, you've probably accumulated a super tall stack of external hard drives over the years. Now that I have a NAS, I can take that pile of external hard drives and punch them. Eh, just kidding. It's best not to punch your hard drives because they're pretty fragile. But now that I have a NAS, I'm never going back. Ugreen hooked me up with a NAS Sync DXP4800+. Plus. It's basically like your own cloud storage system that lives on your own network. The main thing it does is house four hard drives, and if you use 28 terabyte drives, it can hold a total of 112 terabytes. I'm using four of these Western Digital 4 terabyte WD Red drives. The assembly is super easy. You just pop out these carriages and pop in the drives. Then they slide right back into the device. Plug an ethernet cable into the back and connect the other side to your Wi-Fi router. Power it on and just like that, it's on your network. You can access it through any computer connected to the network and begin the setup. I'm setting up all four hard drives as a single storage volume with RAID 5, so that means that if any one of the drives fail, all my data will still be safe. Right now I'm accessing the DXP4800 Plus via Wi-Fi, which is fine for backups, as it's still faster than Google Drive. But if you do a direct wired connection, you can get 1 gigabit speeds. And if you use a 10 gigabit network switch, you can get 10 gigabit speeds. But even just in the simple wireless configuration, having a NAS is super useful because you can seamlessly access data from all the computers connected to your Wi-Fi. For example, once I'm done generating a CNC routing or 3D printing toolpath, I can just drag it into the CNC folder that I made on the NAS. Then I can go out to the garage, hop on the CNC laptop, and connect to the server to access my toolpath. It's super easy. Gone are the days of sending yourself stuff over Slack. Or if you use a Raspberry Pi with OctoPrint to manage 3D printers remotely, you can use the NAS to send files to the printers. And it also makes sharing 3D print files effortless. Ugreen NAS Sync can be your 3D printing workflow game changer. Backing up your data is super important, and Ugreen can help. Big thanks to Ugreen for solving all my storage woes and sponsoring this video. Now back to the ground effect vehicle experiments. Okay, let's see if this thing works at all. The handling in the water has improved significantly, that's for sure. The reason why ground handling is so much better is that I have the water propellers set up to do differential thrust, so they help the boat turn. <laughs> So the water propellers give the appearance that they're operating as intended, but whether or not they're actually doing anything useful is a harder question to answer. So we'll try to figure that out over the course of the video. That was it. That was pretty sick. Now's probably a good time to explain why I'm doing this in the first place. Reason one is that it's just a super fun concept to experiment with. Reason two is an attempt to make ground effect vehicles a little more practical and resilient. You see, water is surprisingly sticky. The faster you go, the more water behaves like syrup. That's why if you jump off the Golden Gate Bridge, you'll die. And it's why super fast boats are designed to touch the water as little as possible. Not even the whole propeller is submerged. Ground effect vehicles travel over water really fast and low. In a perfect world, they don't contact the water at all. But in reality, it happens quite a bit, especially in turbulent air or rough water. When they do accidentally contact the water, they can lose quite a bit of speed since they're going really fast. And at high speeds, water is really sticky. So what if we could make it so that the ground effect vehicle doesn't lose any speed when it contacts the water? That would be pretty nice, huh? And it would be even cooler if we could make it actually speed up when it contacts the water. More speed means more lift, which would make it fly up out of contact with the water. So it's a self-stabilizing feedback loop. Now hopefully you can see where I'm going with this project. Oof. That was a crash. I just crashed into the dock. Not so good. We're taking on water, Captain. The gyroid is filling. I think I spared the motor though. Oh, it looks like the nose hit. Scraped some goose poop off the dock. Well, that was a good test. These things worked way better than I thought they would. So to repair our broken pontoon, I basically just drilled some holes in there with a Dremel and then poured in expanding polyurethane foam. I also used CA to just glue the cracked portion back on. But I figured the foam would expand out into the gyroid infill and kind of lock the two halves together. And of course, as usual, I poured in way too much foam and it expanded a ton. Another issue is that this titanium shaft is not perfectly straight and it vibrates like crazy. I tried straightening it out by hand, but that didn't really work, so I ended up throwing it back in the lathe and grinding down the whole thing so that a bearing could slide all the way down to the midway point. Then I 3D printed a little bearing holder pillow block and super glued that into place. 
That constrains the shaft enough to prevent it from vibrating like crazy. I'm also adjusting the ESC settings with the BL Heli 32 configuration app. Lastly, I threw some rubber bands in there to hopefully prevent the propellers from skipping over the water as much. So for the first test run today, I'm testing the rubber bands in place, and I also lowered the maximum PWM for the water motors to 1800 microseconds. So basically what that's gonna do is make the water motors hit full throttle before the air motors. So we're gonna get more power out of the water motors. So from the previous video of this project, we know this thing works great while getting powered by the air motors, but what I'm doing now is adjusting the bias more towards the water motors so that they are running at a higher throttle level relative to the air motors. In my mind, the ideal outcome here would be to be able to turn the air motors off entirely and rely solely on the water motors. Not necessarily because that's the best way to operate in a practical setting, but just because it would be really cool. So here the air motors were attenuated by like 20% and it still seems to work totally fine, if not better. In a perfect world, if the water motors worked as well as I hoped they might, then I might be able to just drive this thing around over the surface of the water like an RC car and not have to worry about pitch or altitude at all. And during this test, it was almost at that point. Here you can see I'm making a big wide turn. It definitely won't turn sharp like an RC car, but it can turn. And it can even survive slowing down quite a bit in the turn since the par thrust generates so much lift even at zero airspeed. So all in all, I was pretty happy with how this thing was working. This should be interesting. I just unplugged the air motors entirely, so it's only using the water motors now. Oh yeah, I don't think this is gonna work. There's not enough lift in the front. It really needs the air motors to do the, the par thrust to get the nose up. Okay, now I'm adjusting the power bias even more. So the water motors are gonna hit full throttle when the air motors are only at 50%. As I raise the stick, the water motors are going to hit full throttle first. Interesting. <laughs> when it touches down on the water, you can actually see it accelerate. So that goes to show the water motors might be doing something. Wow, I do think the water motors actually propel the thing. The air motors were just at such a low throttle level when I was coasting there. Now I had the ESCs set so that the water motors were hitting 100% throttle when the air motors were only at 50% throttle. And to stay in the ground effect and not just fly up too high, I really couldn't raise the throttle above around 70%. So this means that the water motors were most likely doing the majority of the propulsion here. And the air motors were really only contributing to a small portion of the thrust. They were contributing a lot of thrust on takeoff to get the nose up, but once in cruise, I was able to stay up with fairly little throttle. One thing I think some people might not understand here, unless I explicitly say it, is that these propellers are surface piercing. They're supposed to walk across the surface like they're doing here. All the fastest speedboats use surface piercing propellers, because like I said before, water is very sticky at high speeds, and you really don't want to have to drag a prop shaft or a lower unit assembly through the water, because you lose a ton of power doing so. And it still flies well, even while it's full of water. So I wanted to see if I could get to the point where the water motors were the only thing really powering this aircraft, and the air motors were fully off. So I mapped the water motor throttle signal wires to a three position switch. That way I could turn them on completely independently of the air motors. Frick. I did not expect that to happen today. What the hell, was that a gust of wind or something? That super sucks. I don't want to fill up the rescue paddleboard today. It's cold. It turns out the motors are on for some reason. The, uh, the air motors are on, but right now they're water motors. And this thing just happened to drive itself back to shore. That is so funny. It's gonna come right into the dock. This is so perfect. Okay, let's try this again. So on this day, I was basically trying the same thing, which is using all the motors to get airborne and then turning off the air motors and seeing if the water motors alone could sustain flight or whatever you want to call it. As you can see here, when the air motors stop spinning, it does not continue to fly. But then again, when the air motors are not spinning, they're making drag. So maybe this isn't the best test approach. Okay, turning off the air motors right now. Oh yeah, no chance, it just bogs down. So after doing a few more test runs, it became obvious that this was just not going to work. But then this happened. Holy crap, it actually kind of just worked. And I wasn't even recording. This onboard footage is the only evidence I have, but if you look carefully, you can see that the air motors throttle down, but it continues to go because it's being propelled by the water motors. 
The air motors are still spinning, but they're just freewheeling from the oncoming wind. They weren't actually providing any thrust here. It didn't last for that long, but it did go for a little while, so that was really cool to see. So why did this only work once and not all the time? I think there's a few reasons. First of all, these water propellers probably were not optimal. We would have greatly benefited from a higher pitch prop, and for how low the prop pitch was, the motors were probably not spinning fast enough. These are only 2700 kV motors running on a 4 cell, so we probably would have benefited greatly from a higher kV motor. And lastly, these motors were probably just a bit undersized for how big and heavy this aircraft is. Ultimately, this airframe is probably not optimal for the surface drive ground effect vehicle concept because it's got four big propellers in the front and that adds a lot of drag when they're off. So I'd like to revisit this concept again in the future and build a specialized airframe that's made just for being propelled by surface piercing propellers in the water. So stay tuned for that. By the way, I turned on the channel memberships feature for this channel, and I've been uploading a lot of the extra test footage that doesn't make the main cut that I would have previously just thrown away. So if you can't get enough RC test flight and also want to help support the channel, consider signing up as a channel member. That's all for now. Thanks for watching. Bye.